thank you. Um, I think I will not use the microphone. Everybody can hear me, right? Is my voice loud enough? Yeah, yeah. keep it loud. <laughs> all right, because I need my hands so I can type stuff. So, all right, so uh, yeah, welcome everybody. It's cool that we can be here today and talk about APIs uh, and especially GraphQL. I hope that friends in my introduction isn't like too similar, but <laughs> we did really know that we both have the same topic. So I guess it's, it's probably a good idea to hear the introduction from two different points of view, <laughs> because I also don't know too much about the like how GraphQL works under the hood. I just discovered it, started using it, and like fell in love with it immediately. And I basically just want to share my enthusiasm about it. So maybe I can convince someone to start start using it today uh, or tomorrow as well, right? Okay, a little bit uh, of an introduction about myself. So my name is Martin. Um, I'm the CTO of The Outling, it's a local Singaporean startup. Uh, we are like an online art gallery. We also have a mobile app called Last Love. Um, I'm also the founder of BitLab Studio, which is a local, locally based uh, web agency. Uh, both companies are hiring, by the way, so if you like, want to work with React and GraphQL and all the cool stuff and Python and Django, you should you know, reach out to me. You can reach out to me via Twitter, and Brock is my handle pretty much everywhere. Um, and you can just shoot me an email. Uh, I'm pretty sure we, I will share the slides with you. I have them on speaker deck, so you can update the meetup uh, page, and then everybody will be able to download the slides, and then you will be able to reach out to me. Um, I also, unfortunately, after this, I have to leave immediately. I have some important stuff waiting for me at home. And so if you have more questions after the talk, I mean, I'm open to questions right after the talk, but like, I have to, I have to leave, and uh, you won't be able to catch up with me. So just shoot me some emails or you know, tweet me or whatever uh, tomorrow or any time later. So today I want to show two technologies. One is GraphQL and the other one, you know, goes in tandem with it. It's called Graphene Python. It's, it's a way to use GraphQL as a Python developer, okay? So um, both have nice websites, so let's just look at it. And it's essentially the GraphQL website is extremely well done. Um, I don't really need to create any smiles because I couldn't do it any better than these guys have done already. Um, so what is GraphQL? It's a query language for your API. Okay, I kind of can understand that. So how does a query look like? A query looks like this. Okay, it's essentially just brackets and then you say, I want to have something from my hero database, from my, from my hero table, and I want the column name and height. All right? And the result looks exactly like what you have requested. It has the same structure. So you have hero again here, and then you have the columns that you have requested with the values of that item. Okay? So it's a query language. That's really all it is. Okay? Um, the cool thing about it is uh, when you think about your app, you will, and, and when you think about um, React.js with all its components, who has used React.js? Sure. Uh, show of hands. Anyone? No one? <laughs> okay, so um, you kind of have to use React on the front end, but um, you can also use Angular and, and all these other fancy JS frameworks these days. Um, okay, but this might be a bit difficult to explain then. Basically, in, the idea of React is that you componentize your entire website, right? You might have a footer component, header component, main navigation, main navigation item, maybe you have an avatar when you are logged in at the top right of your website. So you componentize the entire website, and each component needs some data that it should display, right? So for example, when you think about the avatar component, it maybe needs to have the first name, last name of the user, and maybe a link to the picture of that user, right? So this component can now write a query like this, and say, I, wa I want the currently logged in user, and I only want first name, last name, and avatar picture. And you will have many of these components, so you will, you will have many of these tiny, tiny queries, right? And GraphQL kind of allows you, uh, or essentially the client that you will use with GraphQL, which is either Apollo or Relay, allows you to collect all these queries and put them into one big query and send only one request to your database or to your, to your backend server. The backend server will then go to your database, fetch all the data, and send only one response back, so you save a lot of bandwidth. and. Um, yeah, I will, I will show this in detail later on my slides. Um, so if you want to use GraphQL, what you have to do first is create a schema. You have to, you have to tell GraphQL how your database looks like, right? Um, so you would say like, okay, my app has, uh, has a character and they have names and e each of these fields can even be subfields. So like here, home world is of type planet and planet is its own database table, for example, okay? And yeah, so um, 
Then GraphQL has this cool thing called GraphQL, which is like a web editor, uh, like an IDE, um, where you can write your queries, and it has like uh, code completion, so you can press control space, and it shows you what kind of endpoints are available. And then when you, so this is an endpoint here, all films, right? And then you wonder, um, what's inside? Okay, more films. And what does a film have? And it shows you in the code completion, the film has a title and a creation date and whatever. So you don't have to remember anymore, how does my database actually look like, or how many endpoints does my API have, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, this makes working with it extremely nice as a developer. You just, you know, first thing you do in the morning, you open up GraphQL, you wonder like, oh, okay, I want to build a component uh, about, uh, which needs an address of the user. So you just start typing bracket users, bracket address, bracket, and then you have street, zip, first name, last name, and all these things, right? And you don't have to look into your code anymore, uh, look up these models uh, or these database tables to figure out what's available. So it's, it makes you really, really fast. Um, Okay, so th this is enough for introduction on the website. The other technology that we will talk about is Graphene. Um, <clears throat> so the problem with GraphQL is it depends what kind of database you are using. This, this dictates if you can use GraphQL today or not. Okay? But um, I think most popular databases these days already have like GraphQL wrappers available. I, I mean, um, and if you use something like uh, GraphQL, uh, Graphene, you can essentially write your own wrapper around any kind of data source. You don't even have to connect to a Postgres database. You could write um, your types and your fields. Yeah? So just to confirm, so GraphQL is directly to the database. It's not a wrapper around the rest of GraphQL? It could, yeah, that's what I just want to say. You could essentially write a wrapper around any data source. What, in GraphQL, what you define is, um, my application has a schema, and there is something like a planet in my schema. But where it actually comes from, what kind of database it is, doesn't matter. Uh, you will eventually end up writing functions like um, these resolver functions here. So in this example, it says, so uh, my app has a query, and there's one field on that query. So I would say this is similar to an endpoint, to a REST endpoint that we would normally in a REST API have. And this endpoint is called hello. and its type is just a string. So when you call this endpoint, you always get back just a string. And in this example, it's even very static and boring. It always returns world. Okay? But these functions here, they are just Python functions. And you can you know, send requests to the Twitter API or to your Postgres database or to your MongoDB database. And you just return whatever type you promised you will return on that field. So you can actually create a, a super monster API that gets data from anywhere. Okay? And you only have one endpoint. So everything goes against the GraphQL endpoint, and it gets one response back. Right? No more worry about, OK, what URLs does my a API have, and so on. You don't have to document your bloody API anymore. There is only one endpoint, and it documents itself. You just start typing in the GraphQL editor, and it shows what's available. Okay? So um, yeah, the Graphene homepage doesn't show much more, so let's just dive into it. Um, OK, so I, I like to have. Um, in my, in my presentations, I like to show real code. Um, does anyone have used Django before? Show of hands. Okay, so three people, <laughs> three, three and a quarter people. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, but don't worry. So this is also now pretty good for you guys because it's, this is also a Django crash course. Um, so if you want to use Django, um, you would usually create a virtual environment first. I've already done that. So that's this tool, that's this tool MK virtual env, and you give this environment a name. I've already done it. So these brackets here show you that I'm currently running a sandbox environment. And if I install any Python packages right now, they will be installed into this sandbox environment. Okay. So I have this environment now. Next step would be to you know actually install Django. So you do pip install Django. So in the Python world. In the JavaScript world, you know npm. In the Ruby world, you have like gem install. And in Python, we do pip. Okay, this was pretty fast because I've already done it. Um, and then Django gives you this Django admin command, and you can say start project, and we give it a name, I think, GraphQL demo. Yeah. And this will set up a folder for you, GraphQL demo. Okay? Uh, let's, let's see what's inside. Uh, there are, there's a subfolder inside and a few files. Um, next thing we need to do, all right. I need to go into the settings file. So Django created the settings file for me. And I need to put my IP in here. 
So that's, you know, ignore this. This is Django stuff, not super important. Um, and that should be it. If, if everything is fine, I should be able now to run uh, my local development server. Let's see. Uh, Localhost. Oh, nope. It should be 8,000. Oh, okay. I, um, I said that I want to have this IP. It worked. So this is what you see when you just created a new Django application, all right? Um, okay, but th this doesn't do much. Um, so in Django, oh yeah, okay, sorry. The next step after you created a Django project is to create an app, okay? In Django, you cut down your whole app, entire application into small apps. One app deals with the user profile, one app deals with your shopping cart, one app deals with your product database, and so on. So uh, we would do something like Django admin um, start app, and we could just call it, the app is called Simple App. A very stupid name. Um, and usually the first thing you do is you describe how the database tables of that app should look like. So I have a Simple App folder here now, and there's a models file inside. And I'll just copy and paste from my slides. So essentially I'm saying, I want to have a database table called Message. And this should have three fields, three columns should be on my table, uh, a user, creation date and the message. The message is just text field, user's uh, daytime field, uh, uh, sorry, creation date, and user is a foreign key to another table. And Django already comes with a few built-in tables. So this user table here already exists and I can create a foreign key, all right? Um, okay, so, and then this is typical Django stuff. Um, you need to teach Django that this simple app thing now exists so that it knows um, that there's a model inside. Then Django has a very nice command uh, called make migrations, a simple app. So this will create SQL statements. So you can deploy your app on the server and it will know, oh, there's a new table. I have to like, create table message with these columns and so on. And whenever you change anything in your models file, maybe I create another field later and I need to, and I need to have an uh, alter table statement, right? You, you run um, make migrations again, it detects the changes and it creates the corresponding SQL statements for you. And it creates those in a very cool way, you can even migrate backwards. So if you deploy something that is broken, you could roll back to your earlier version of your database. Uh, so this is uh, the main reason why I use Django, um, so because it makes it so easy to manage your database, okay? So after I have created my migration, I will run to actually migrate, so this all this actually executed these uh, alter table statements now. So now I have a real database. By default, Django creates a SQLite database. You could switch that in the second settings to uh, MySQL or Postgres easily, okay? Um, all right, and okay, I need to do one more thing here. Uh, admin sign register uh, from here. Models, models, message, okay. So if everything went well, and it never goes well, um, I can still go to my site, and I should be able to log into the Django admin. Ha, okay, I have no user, so I can't log in. So there's another command, create super user, uh, which I should type correctly. S create super user, okay, let's call him admin. And then we start the development server again. And now we should be able at admin to log in. And this is another reason why I like to use Django because it has this built-in admin interface, which is, which is essentially like a database management interface. So I can see my tables here and I can start you know, creating entries. Uh, hello world, and maybe Great. And well, I have two rows in my database. Okay, so looks like so far everything's fine, but you know, you don't want to learn about Django. You want to learn about Graphene. That's why we're here today and GraphQL. So um, we would do pip install Django, uh, Graphene Django, which I've already done. Um, and then every time you install a third party reusable Django app via pip, 
you need to teach Django that this is now part of my project. So you go back to your settings file and you say Django Graphene is now part of my project. And, and, and most apps have oops, most apps have some specific extra settings. So in this case, we need to teach uh, Graphene that our schema, remember? GraphQL is just a query language and we need uh, to set up the schema so GraphQL understands what kind of objects are available in our world. Um, so we need to teach it where is my schema file. So we say in the GraphQL demo folder, there's going to be a file called schema, Python file. And in that file, there will be something schema equals whatever. We will see that later. Okay? So this setting basically tells Graphene where it should look like, what is the entry point of my API. Um, all right, and um, each of my apps also will have a schema file because you know we, we cut down our, our whole project in small apps. Each app has its own database tables, and for each database table, you usually want to create endpoints so that you can access and write data. Um, and you don't want to have one gi gigantic schema file with 5,000 lines of code, uh, so you, you create uh, sub schema files in each of your app folders. Um, so there will be a schema file in the simple app folder as well. And that file looks like this. All right. So we import Graphene. So this is, uh, has anyone used Python before? Basically the guys who also use Django. <laughs> so, and because we installed um, Graphene Django, we can import this Django object type here and we import the models of the own app, right? So this is essentially the file where we created our message table here. Um, and so this is how it works. We, we say, oops, we say our API has a query and the query has one endpoint called all messages. And the type, the return value of that endpoint is a list and each item in that list is a message type. Okay, what's a message type? Okay, we create this ourselves, okay? and. Um, and the good thing is it's like nicely integrated with Django. So we, we, we just say the type should be based on the message model. And that's all we have to do. So creating the schema for your huge application that might already be there is super easy. You just have to write like three lines of code per model. <laughs> I mean, it will, in, the, in, the, in the real world, it will be a bit more. You might want to, um, you can do things like um, exclude fields, I think. I don't know if it's called like that, but there's something like this. And you could say, um, maybe creation date should not be exposed to my API. People are not allowed to, to you know, query that field. But all the other fields, whenever I add another field to my model here, uh, it will automatically be part of my, of my message type and it will be part of my GraphQL schema, okay? So, oh yeah, so this is the API endpoint name. This is the return value of my endpoint. And for each endpoint, we can create a resolve function. So it's the same name as the endpoint, but it has resolve underscore in front. And it's just a Python function, and you can put any kind of code here. You can you know, do a request to the Twitter or a GitHub API, fetch some data from there, or you know, go to MongoDB or read a file from your file system, or Django has this object relational mapper here. So in Django, you never write SQL. You just say, give me all objects of message type. And this will basically be a select star from message in SQL. So it converts this nicely readable syntax here into SQL eventually. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, but you might remember that we said the entry point is actually this file, GraphQL demo dot schema dot schema, right? So in the GraphQL demo folder dot schema, so this is currently empty, so we put this stuff inside. And uh, again, we have a query here, but we basically don't implement any endpoints on this query because this query is just a collection of all the other queries that we have in our app folders, okay? So we import the schema file from our app folder, and this is basically uh, an object-oriented programming um, uh, like multi-class inheritance. So you will just create a class that derives from all your Apps. So if we had a lot of apps, we would just put them all here as parent classes of this query class, okay? Um, and then we create this schema variable and we call this graphene schema, whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, okay, finally, 
Django has, and Rails is quite similar, um, has this uh, URLs file. Why is it not in my editor? <coughs> so let me delete this part. So usually the Django URLs file by default looks like this. It only has the admin URL. And we've already been using that to create the two uh, database entries, right? So we have to add two more lines here. So we import this GraphQL view, which comes from Django Graphene, and we hook it up here. So now, under the URL GraphQL, this GraphQL view will be executed, okay? So I think now we can test stuff. Yep, so let's try that. We restart the server, and now we go to GraphQL. Oh, it's GraphQL. Yay. And this is the cool thing now. Hmm, what endpoints do I have? I press brackets, right? And press, ah, it's called all messages. All right, and then what is the, what is the return value? Oh, okay, it knows it's the type message type, and my message model has ID, creation date, and message, and user, remember, our model has actually also a user foreign key. Um, where is it? Here. This doesn't show up, because this is another database table, and we haven't defined in our schema yet where this endpoint is and what type it is. So unless I define another type, a user type, uh, I cannot query the user data here, okay? So, okay, when I think this is correct, I execute this query and voila, I get the two entries that I already have in my database, okay? Um, all right, so... <laughs> intermission. <clears throat> You might wonder, okay, this is pretty cool, but what, what, why do I need that on my front end? How does this look like when I use it on my front end? And unfortunately, nobody here has used React.js, so <laughs> this slide might be a little bit confusing now. But basically, um, in React, um, in the end, you create components for all the stuff on your website, right? Let's say a user have a job, something on the top right side of our website, like, you know, picture, username. Um, so this is supposed to be a component in this JavaScript, right? And each component must have a render function, and the render function must return HTML markup, okay? So we could say the user avatar is a div with an image inside. Easy, right? The problem is, what, what is the image, right? We need to get that out of our database. So what we can do now is uh, we could use something called a follow, and I'll give a talk tomorrow at the talk.js meetup at PayPal, same time um, and describe how this will work on the front end. Um, so you could use something like Apollo and this allows you to write your query, right? And usually you use GraphQL. You write your query in GraphQL and you copy and paste it right into the, into the into your front end. And then you wrap your component with this um, decorator here, you know, GraphQL, and put this query variable into your decorator. And now by some magic, uh, the component has access to this uh, cross dot data. Okay, this comes from um, GraphQL. And it has, data has dot loading. So when the GraphQL request is in flight, loading is true. When the response came back, or when, it, when the request failed, loading will become false. So in our render function, we can say something like, if it's currently loading, we just, we, we don't return the avatar. We return, we, you know, you could have, you, you could return an image that shows dot, 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 that is still loading, or loading spinner, or nothing, or like, just the text loading, right? Um, and once it's no longer loading, you will then you can then execute data dot, and this is it's the object that we have queried. It's the endpoint of our GraphQL query, right? And then this is the field that we have queried, avatar, right? Okay. So this is, I mean, this is pretty awesome when you think about it. Uh, you task a freelancer, hey, write me an avatar component. You don't even have to give him access to your code base or anything, right? You can you can give him a small ripple that is just tied up so that it has access to your GraphQL endpoint, and then he, is, he has to write just one file and give you back that file, and you can integrate this into your project. This component doesn't need to know anything about how the uh, app works in total, okay? So how does an app need to look like in React? Your entire app is essentially just a collection of many, many components, okay? Like all these things, they look like HTML, right? But they are React components that we have written, like the avatar component that we have just seen on the other slide. And we might have a main navigation component, a header component, footer component, uh, whatever. And you just wrap 
with Apollo, you grab the Apollo provider around everything. So the Apollo provider will make sure that when each of these components here uh, tell the app what queries they want to execute, the Apollo provider collects them all and merges them together into one big query and sends just one request to your server, takes back one response, and then distributes the data, exactly the data the component requested, back to the components. Okay? <coughs> and even if you have a few components that uh, maybe one component needs user profile, but just the ID. The component just wants to know, is the user currently logged in? Another component needs the avatar. Maybe some other component needs first name, last name. So they have similar queries, but different, but all the queries want user profile. And the Apollo provider, when it gets all the queries, it will, it will see, all right, I have one component that wants ID, one wants avatar, one wants email. It will merge it all into essentially this, right? And, and when, it comes, when the result comes back, it will only give down those fields to the component that has been requested by that component, okay? So, I mean, hopefully you can kind of see how this is awesome, right? Uh, each component doesn't know anything about all the other components. You save a lot of bandwidth. You know, you know my, my mobile app at the moment, when you just open it, it sends like 18 H, uh, API requests. It fetches all kinds of stuff, uh, because on Android, usually, you have to tap the navigation, like you have four main entries at the bottom, and they are all mounted immediately. So, and same for the Twitter app and so on, because when you switch between two pad, uh, tabs, it should load immediately. So, even if you just open the front page, uh, actually, for all the views, even the ones that you can't see at the moment, the requests are already sent out, right? So I'm sending tons and tons of uh, HTTP requests all the time. There's a lot of overhead, right? And for example, um, if I have a product list view, our products, they have a massive amount of fields, like 60 or 80 fields in the database, and my API endpoint re returns all the fields, all the time, right? There's so much data that I'm, and, but when you think about the product list view, what do you see? A picture, a name, a price, three fields, right? But I'm sending 50 fields over the wire, wasting bandwidth for everyone, right? Uh, pro probably even wasting performance and, uh, and RAM on the machine because all this data has to be stored somewhere. Okay. Check with you, is the navigation of the query done by Apollo or done by GraphQL? Um, actually, I don't know. I think it's done by Apollo. Yeah. I have a query about how you will handle the multiple sessions from queries coming from different browsers. Yeah, so Apollo. Um, um, has this batch network interface. Uh, so if all this, I, okay, I'm not 100% sure, first of all, if Apollo does the merging or if GraphQL does the merging. So maybe I'm saying something wrong here, but some, one of the two merges everything into one big query. And logically, I think it should be Apollo. Um, and if you have components, um, I mean, maybe sometimes you want to send a query because the user clicks a button, right? In the beginning, when the app mounts, all the components essentially uh, broadcast their queries at the same time, and Apollo will probably catch it all, merge it, and send just one request. But what if a few seconds later, the user starts tapping around, and it generates lots of lots of more queries after the fact, after the app is loaded, right? Um, Apollo will put them into a queue, and every 10 milliseconds, it will take them all, merge them again, and send them to the server. So if you have an app that, for some reason, quickly generates tons of queries, you still save bandwidth because uh, you, you can't say how many milliseconds you want to clean up your queue. Okay, I'm using uh, uh, the Zango for the uh, our, our automation portal, mm -hmm. like where multiple users can access uh, our uh, can run automation scripts. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm getting requests from multiple users in our internet. Okay. So how we can handle the session? Second thing, if we have to change based on the user need, how okay. we will maintain the version control? Yep, I think. This might actually show up on one of my next slides. Let me go through this. So to quickly answer your question, when you create these functions here, the resolver functions, or the I will talk about mutations in a second, you have the context, and this is the request. So this is like when you think about Django, you use Django, right? You have like request on user. Right. You can do context of user. This is essentially the Django request object. Okay. It is the Django request object. Uh, so yeah, this is how uh, when several requests are coming in, it's the same like uh, Django restaurant. It's really exactly the same. You can think of this like uh, of the resolver functions or of the mutate functions. It's essentially your Django API keys. And for different things, we have to make some users changing. So how do we maintain the code of version? 
Um, okay, this is something I haven't done yet, but um, it's something that they advertise on the GraphQL homepage. Uh, yeah. So essentially, maybe later on you add a new field on your query, uh, on your schema. You just just do that. And if you deprecate a field, you can put this deprecated thing here. So you, there's a way in GraphQL when you build your schema to say that we, we had this field in the past, but now it's deprecated and it shouldn't be used anymore. So your old clients, they will still access this field. Your new clients, if they send queries still using that field, you'll get a, you'll get a warning message. And Obviously, your, uh, the actual implementation of your functions needs to be able uh, to deal with both kinds of requests. So you could also have versioning by simply, um, you know, um, when you think about the URLs pi here, we are hooking up GraphQL endpoint like this, right? You could have version one and you hook it up. Oh, wait, no, this doesn't work. Hmm. Okay, I'm not sure about versioning. I'm I'm not sure about versioning right now because the entry point is actually in the Django settings and that's just one. So I I'm not sure how to do versioning. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Would you not just have Graphql underscore one, Graphql underscore two. You mean here? Yeah. So you, you could, but you are. We would have to have something where we can define which query yeah. class should be passed in here. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be anything. Um, I, but when you Google for you know Django, Graphql, and versioning, I have seen a GitHub issue already where people were discussing uh, how to handle how to deal with this. I think. You know, the people at Facebook who invented all this stuff, they are against versioning. They say API versioning is, an, is a bad practice and you shouldn't do it. Um, so I think that's why they might not really care that much about it. And maybe that's why GraphQL doesn't have something obvious built into it. Um, so, <coughs> what's next? Okay, one more example. Actually, two more. Filtering and then mutations and then I'm done. Um, so at the moment, we just had a query and we just get the list of all items. What if we just want to get a subset of all items? I mean, it's very common that you need to, you have an API endpoint which allows you to have get parameters to query uh, lesser items than all items, right? So we could update our schema like this. The only change is we now import this uh, filter connection field here. And here, before, you, you might remember this was like, it was saying this is a list. Now it's not just a list, now it's a Django filter connection field. And uh, we can define which columns of our database can be queried. So we will say we can query by the message field. <laughs> and it's a case insensitive field. I contains means uh, I can search for substrings in my total, right? It's a full text search, okay? Um, and the rest remains the same. The resolver function still returns simply all objects. The querying, the filtering down, happens by magic. <laughs> um, is that enough? This filter is not done by database. Uh, no, the filter is done by Django. So that in the Django world, there is a very popular project called Django Filter, uh, and this allows you to create arbitrarily complicated filters and hook them up here with your endpoints. Um, so how does this look like in GraphQL? So, and by the way, all the time, every time when you change your schema, you need to refresh this uh, page. Um, ooh, this is not good. Oh yeah, I know why, okay. So, once again, I start writing my query, right? Okay, I want all messages, and I want, I want a filter. And it already shows me the message field can be filtered, and it's an I contains filter. Okay, so I'll choose this, and then I say, show me everything that starts with HE. And um, so usually when you create something that returns several objects, you always have to have this edges and nodes. And as I said, I don't really understand how GraphQL works under the hood, so I cannot describe why edges and nodes needs to be used. I just accept the fact that this is uh, like it is. 
and all I care about is that it works. So, um, see, hello world, right? And we are filtering for the substring HE, or I can search for WO, still returns hello world. If I just search for nothing, I get all the items in the database, so filtering works, all right? Um, <clears throat> oh, okay, this is actually already my last slide. Wait, it seems like some slides have gone missing. Where are my mutations? What the hell? Didn't I just have a slide about mutations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I deleted it. <laughs> okay, when did I do that? <clears throat> okay. Okay, so filtering and querying, all, all nice, but we want to write data. Our APIs, our REST APIs have put and post requests, right? So how can we do that? Um, in our schema file, everything happens in the schema file, basically. We say, now we have query endpoints, and now we have more endpoints. We have mutation endpoints as well. Uh, so this is an endpoint that's called create message, right? And it's like of this type create message mutation. So I have to invent this create message mutation here as well. And mutations always have an input, so you define what kind of data needs to be provided so that this mutation works, and an output. So this is the uh, fields that come back. These fields are queryable in the normal way as if they were uh, queryable endpoints. And then you write a, uh, a mutate function. So here I'm basically checking if the user is logged in. If not, I create an instance of this class, and I set form errors, right, one of the uh, output fields, to please log in. And if the user is logged in, um, I, you know, I just create an object in the database. This is basically the equivalent of an SQL create statement, uh, insert statement, um, and I once again return an instance of this class. And this time, I don't provide form errors, but I provide message. The message that I have just created here, and no form errors, okay? So, and uh, before this can work, we need to add this mutation to our main schema file. So here, we now have queries from all of our apps and mutations from all of our apps. It should be it. Oh yeah, and then in Django, there's uh, some uh, protection built in CSRF uh, protection against hacking and so on. Um, for the, you have to kind of disable that because all requests against this GraphQL endpoint are post requests, and we don't have a CSRF token available at that moment. Um, okay, hopefully that works. Okay, server still running. Need to restart my. Okay, this looks good. So now I say I want to do a mutation, and so what kind of mutations do I have? Ah, there's only one, so it already uh, provides this name, create message, and aha, uh -huh, it needs a field message. So I mean, I can only create a message if I provide some content, some content, yeah. um, and it returns form errors and the message itself. And we know that the message is of a certain type, right? So we can query all these fields once again. And boom, I have just created a new uh, item in my database. So let's, let's just look if that's true. Now there are three. I, I initially only created two, and some content says it's actually in the database. So that's mutations. All right. Um, yeah, as I said at the beginning, uh, I, I run several companies, and we are hiring. If you want to do cool stuff with React, uh, shoot me an email. <laughs> um, yeah, any questions? I guess we should keep this short. Which one? The code do you have open code? The code? The site? Allowed host uh, IP address. Yeah. Like if you want to make it a uh, your this portal as an intranet, anyone can access in this intranet. Yeah. Allowed host, you can give your IP address, right? And it will be accessible. Yeah. But instead of giving like IP number, like zero 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 zero, you have given. Can we keep logging in? Yeah, you can. How? I mean, uh, when you deploy your Django backend into the cloud, you will put the domain name into the 
in China. Complete. Yeah, but I think uh, this Django instance will be hooked up with some domain name, and you just put that into the allow host settings. Can you give allow in IP instead of IP address in allow host in your setting? Yeah, it doesn't have to be an IP. It can be a domain. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a domain here now, so. Instead of giving zero zero in the uh, allowed host, if you give any name, like Martin name. Yeah, this, this will not work. Um, will not work. How we can change? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't work because I don't have a DNS server running that hooked up Martin. As the internet, your IP will be visible to everyone. You don't want to make your IP visible, so you want to give any name here. Mm. You could have name here. Um. So instead of saying IP address, we should give some particular name. And then app name, slash app name. Only yeah. fine, 8,000 columns. Well, I, actually, even in your intranet, yeah. won't, won't everything be a subdomain of your main company's domain? No, right? They are just host names of the machines. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure if Django can be run like that. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Tina? So does it mean that I don't need Django RESTful framework? Yeah, you don't need Django RESTful framework anymore. <laughs> I, I've just spent like I've just spent two years of my life building fifty thousand lines of Django RESTful framework, and now I will delete everything and, <laughs> and write it again and, and okay. copy it. But you can actually just copy and paste the your view functions over into the resolver and the mutate functions. I th I started doing that. It's pretty easy. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, how do you uh, <laughs> I'm giving uh, another talk uh, at the 29th of this month, at the end of the month. You can, on meetup.com, you can check out check Singapore Django Knots group. Um, and this will be a long workshop where I cover both like, the back end, the front end, and I'll do a test driven as well. Testing is essentially super easy. I mean, you, you can just instantiate the mutation class or the query class, uh, and then you just call the resolver functions. You put in a fake request. Uh, some fake data, and you just call these functions in your unit test. It's very easy. It's easier to test in the language framework, and that's already easy to test. Uh, Nine Django question yeah. related to the React app. Mm. Can you talk to a endpoint uh, spitting out first and not uh, GraphQL? Uh, no, Apollo will be configured uh, when you set up the Apollo network interface, you say the URL of the endpoint, the GraphQL endpoint, and it only talks to that GraphQL endpoint. Yeah. But as I said, um, when you set up your schema and you write your query resolver functions, these can talk to any endpoint. So when you define your GraphQL schema, you can pick data from any data source. And the result is always uh, REST. It's, it's, uh, JSON, uh, sorry, it's JSON strings. Yeah. For your just now the schema now actually is one schema mapping to one uh, Django class, right? Is it always the case that I do like more than one class? Um, well, or is it just uh, the models.py file could have more than one table, right? They could yeah. have messages and uh, yeah. retweets or likes or whatever. There could be many tables, yeah. and the schema will handle all these tables from the same app. Yeah. It can get quite big. Um, but usually I try to keep my apps very, very small. So each app doesn't have more than three tables or whatever. Yeah. Um, authentication and authorization. <laughs> Come at the end of the month. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you mentioned Rails a couple of times. Is that in your real class as well or are you purely Django? I'm purely Django. I just, you know, I see a lot of Rails people, yeah. a couple of Rails people, so I know that there are similarities here and there. So I just like to measure in case somebody doesn't know Django, but knows Rails, so that I don't lose people in the audience. There is also Rails. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry, I, I hope this didn't take too long. Yeah. Well, we still have some time, right? Uh, all right. Thank you. Yeah.